Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Welcome. So glad that you're here today at FaithBridge. If you're here in Centercourt East, if you're here in Centercourt West, if you're here in the Woodlands campus, welcome to the Woodlands. If you're online watching that way, we're glad that you're here that way as well. Just glad anybody and everybody is here on this Sunday where we start a new series that we're calling Unshakable Faith. And it's also the Sunday we call Back to School Sunday, sort of the end of summer and here we go on a new school year. So take your Bible and if you need a Bible, flag down the ushers. They'll be glad to let you borrow one. We're going to the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. So, um, and if you need a Bible, because you just don't even have one, you can just keep the Bible that they give you, and that's our gift to you. So, last Sunday, I was out just greeting some people, and several of our high school graduates came up to give me a hug and say goodbye, we're leaving for college, and, and I could sense their excitement, but their terror was also palpable as I looked into their eyes and it's so big it's so real and and it is so big and it is so real and this is a huge rite of passage and uh, you know where decisions begin to matter and go with you the rest of your life and all that kind of stuff and and uh, <clears throat> so we talked a little bit and and um, and I encouraged them and then I just just put my hands on their shoulders and said, let me just pray for you. And I just prayed, God, would you bless them and give them a great start, help them to keep building on the foundation that they've laid here all these years in our kids' ministry and our junior high ministry and our senior high ministry, living a biblical lifestyle and a mi missional lifestyle. And just prayed blessing upon blessing and, and said amen, gave them a hug, and off they went. Well, I got thinking to myself a little bit after that about four other guys, roughly the same age, who had an interesting rite of passage. But theirs was not a rite of passage that was chock full of hugs and happy photographs and high fives. No, no. The story for them started in a very different sort of way. See, God had said 2,600 years ago to his chosen Jewish people, you need to turn back to me, turn back to me, turn back to me. He'd even use prophets like Habakkuk and Jeremiah to say, turn back to God, turn back to God, turn back to God. If you don't turn back to God, then I, God, am going to send the wicked Babylonian empire under the leadership of King Nebuchadnezzar, and he's just going to wipe out Jerusalem, and he's going to take many of you off into exile, and that's going to be the consequence. Turn back to me, turn back to me. Well, it happened just as Jeremiah had said was going to happen. Now, the interesting thing about King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, which were located in what is modern-day Iraq, Nebuchadnezzar had a strategy. Unlike the strategies of other leaders who would just basically kill all the men and rape all the women, his strategy was, we're going to kidnap 10,000 of the brightest, best, smartest, and we're going to cart them back to Babylonia. Babylon, and we're going to sort of indoctrinate them in Babylonian lifestyle and just see if we can't Babylonize them. And over time, maybe their Jewishness will be diluted and they'll forget really where they came from and the one true God and all that kind of stuff that they grew up with, and they'll become part of our Babylonian world. Well, four of these 10,000 who were kidnapped were named Daniel and Hananiah and Azariah and uh, what's the other one? Mishael. And they were carted off. Now, with the rest of that 10,000, they found themselves uh, stationed right outside of Babylon. And this is where it got very interesting for them. Because while they were out there, false prophets rose up from among them, 
to try to encourage them. And the false prophets began to, uh, to, to, to say to them, now look, here's what's happening. Uh, God is not behind what is going on here. We are the chosen people. Babylon is a wicked place. Don't go into that city. Don't get anywhere near that city. Uh, you know, have nothing to do with them. We prophets foresee that God is going to judge that city and we Jewish people are going to come back on top. It's not going to even take very long. But they were false prophets. That's not what God was saying. And you can see, even though they were saying that, you see those kind of things recorded in Jeremiah 28. In Jeremiah 29, the true prophet, Jeremiah, he said just the opposite. He said, this is what the Lord says to the exiles in Babylon. Build houses, settle down, plant gardens, eat what they produce, marry, have sons and daughters, find wives for yourselves and give your daughters in marriage. Increase in number there and do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the Lord to which I've carried you in exile. Pray to the Lord for Babylon because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Don't let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Now, who would you have believed? Jeremiah? Or the false prophets. Oh, I'm sure it would have been terribly easy to believe the false prophets because who wanted to go through what Nebuchadnezzar was having these people go through? I mean, he was stripping them all of their Jewish uh, names that reminded them of the one true God. He was giving them names that honored Baal gods and the Babylonian gods. And he was thrusting them all into a university program that would last three years to acclimate them and indoctrinate them in in the Babylonian lifestyle and Babylonian literature and Babylonian astrology and the occult. And then the blue chippers among the 10,000, the best of the best, he would bring into his close quarters. He'd bring into the palace to serve him most closely, and he would have them castrated. That would happen to Daniel and his three friends. Bet your Sunday school teacher never told you that part if you grew up in church. <laughs> Wonder why. Now, we'll, t- we'll, t- we'll talk about that on the postscript. I can t- t- tell you a little bit more about how we know that, though it doesn't say it overtly in the text. We'll talk about that in the postscript, and if you have any other questions, uh, just text them in, and we'll try to address those in the recording that we do uh, right after here. While I'm saying uh, that, let me give credit where credit is due for many of the thoughts uh, in our talk today to my friend Larry Osborne in his book, Thriving in Babylon, which when I read it, I just felt so inspired um, and have leaned on it heavily uh, as we get going in this series that we're going to be doing here on the book of Daniel for the next several weeks. So back to the question, who would you have believed? The false prophets? Don't go into Babylon. It's a wicked, or Jeremiah saying, Now, this is where you are. This is where God has brought you. So pray for the prosperity of Babylon. Get in there, serve, because if it gets better, you'll get the benefits too. That brings up the question that I think many of us Christians today are asking. How do we, as believers in the biblical God, how do we live in this world that becomes increasingly unbelieving? How can we live full of faith in a world where pluralism, anything goes, relativism, there's no truth, polytheism, every religion, every God, it's it's all about the same. And really most anything except Jesus are the acceptable approach. How do we live in that type of world, which increasingly the world's becoming? I've noticed it, it, it's a source of much confusion for Christians. We find ourselves sort of grasping, trying to figure out how do we do this, uh, it, it, you know, in a way that, that is uh, appropriate, that's acceptable. It makes many Christians fearful, scared, frustrated, even angry. Well, it's not easy to do, but it can be done. 
And Daniel and his three friends are going to give us a template. And it's a wonderful template. So let's turn to his word and learn from him. Daniel chapter 1. We'll start in verse 3. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter into the king's service. Verse 7. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, he gave the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, he gave the name Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief officer for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But, when, but the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord the king who's assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than all the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. uh, Verse 11, Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel and the other three, please test your servants for three days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. Verse 15. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who had eaten the royal food. And so the guard took away their choice food and wine that they were to drink, and he gave them vegetables instead. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, uh, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so they entered into the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. Now, there are three things that we've got to learn in Daniel chapter 1. There's many things we'll learn in the book, but three things for today that we need to... Three observations I want us to make about Daniel and his three friends from chapter 1. The first one, when it comes to how do we live a winsome faith in a world that feels sometimes like it's unraveling around us, how do we do that? First thing, they maintained a spirit of humility. That's the first thing I notice, humility. Nebuchadnezzar, now he was a wicked man. His royal court was filled with godless pagans and practiced the dark arts of astrology and the occult. And yet with every conversation that uh, was had with these three, Daniel and his friends were amazingly cordial, respectful, and humble. And that's a lesson that we Christians have got to learn these days. Too often Christian rhetoric, I mean, you just hear it on, 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 on radio. Just, just listen, the Christian rhetoric is disrespectful. It's vitriolic towards those who oppose us. And we think, we're just talking to ourselves. Nobody else is listening, but the word gets out. And when people think, you don't like me, you don't respect me, you can be certain they're not going to listen to what you have to say. But many of us Christians, we have been told that showing respect to sinful people is selling out. You're selling out if you show respect or that humbly serving a godless boss or a political leader from the wrong side of the aisle is compromising spiritually and is unworthy of a follower of Jesus. That's nonsense. And it kills our potential for reaching people with the hope, the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it turns us into hypocrites who who look to be pretending all about love and grace and forgiveness and all that sort of stuff, all the while 
vitriol is just spewing out of us. When Daniel and his three VIP captured friends, when they arrived in Babylon, they were brought into the king's palace, which meant that they would be served food from the king's table, which was decidedly non-kosher. They knew they couldn't eat that forbidden food. We don't know why. Maybe it was the type of meat that was being served or the way that it was prepared doesn't really matter. But what we know is that they knew we, that this we can't do. That would be sinning against God. But notice, they weren't jerks about it. They didn't cop an attitude. They didn't start banging their forks and knives on the table and say, we demand something different. What did they do? They politely asked the chief eunuch for an alternative. And when that didn't work, they asked the personal guard if he would be willing to test them for 10 days. Just 10 day test. Would you just give us a, just, well, just vegetables and water. Just test it for 10 days. The man agreed. And God did more than just give them physical health. He gave them wisdom and insight to things that they were being taught. So much so that by the end of that three-year course of study, they had graduated at the top of their class. Nobody was even close. But here's the key. Daniel humbly served his captors and his wicked masters so well, so loyally, that he kept getting promoted. And with every promotion, his influence increased. And eventually, both King Nebuchadnezzar and in another chapter that we'll get to uh, in a few weeks, King Darius will both proclaim Daniel's God as the one true God. Now, friends, that doesn't happen when we're disrespectful, when we're arrogant, when we're rude. That doesn't happen. But Look, you know this. Intuitively, you know this. Instinctively, just think in your own mind. Who was it that helped you come towards Jesus Christ, towards God, towards the church? Who, who, I guarantee you, whoever that was in your life, they were not rude. They were not disrespectful. They were not arrogant. They didn't scorn you. They didn't make you feel despised because you would have shut them out. You're like, I don't want anything to do with them. No, the person who influenced you, that brought you and said, hey, you know, who, who, who something was different about. And you're like, I kind of like that person. I can't figure out what's going on inside of him or her, but it's something good. It was their light shining brightly. I guarantee you, they weren't being rude to you. They were being gracious. They were being humble. They were being loving. And over time, you said, I, I'm curious about, I'd like, yeah, I'll go with you to church. I'd be curious to know a little bit more about the things that you believe in the Bible and things like that. That's always the way it works. Nothing of spiritual lasting value ever comes out of being bombastic. Boy, how did I ever learn that in a painful way. I told our leaders about this a year or two ago at a leader meeting, but it bears repeating. It was eight years ago, and uh, I remember it was August, and it was hot. It was humid. Well, it's like it's been kind of recently. And <clears throat> Suzanne was pregnant. She was pregnant with William. She was going to have the baby in early September. And I remember it was on a Sunday evening. I'd preached three or four times that day, that afternoon or evening. I'm running around trying to do all the things that husbands do to make your wife more comfortable when she's very pregnant and, and, and all of that. And, and I remember finally, uh, we got little Wesley was down in bed and she's happy and I'm happy and we're all tired and we sit down. I think we're going to watch some TV and the air conditioning conks out. And I'm like, really? Does it have to be now? And... But then, you know, I looked across the room and Suzanne looked at me and she said, do something. And <laughs> I remembered, hey, I just paid $199 to this air conditioning company about six months ago to, and we're VIPs. We became part of the VIP club. And that means we get moved to the front of the line, you know. So I called up the, the number and I expected them to say, we'll be out in a jiffy. Well, that's not what the lady said. And I identified my, I'm Ken Werlein, and, and uh, you know, da, 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 we need you to come on out. And she said, oh, Mr. Werlein, I'm so sorry. Here's the deal. It's Sunday evening, and we are so backed up. We have fewer workers on Sunday, 
And I can guarantee you, they're gonna be working all the way through the night. The soonest that we will get to your house is tomorrow morning. And at that point, my fuse was short. My patience thin wasn't what I wanted to hear and, and I kind of lost it. I said to her, that is not an acceptable answer. I said, here's the deal. It is hot, my wife is pregnant, and I am tired. And plus, I gave you $199 to become one of your VIP people, and you're not treating me like a VIP right now, and I demand that you give me a better answer than you just gave me, so try it again. And she said, Mr. Orline, again, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I'm like, that is not what I want to hear. Bam, and I hung up the phone. At that point, I looked across, and Suzanne said, probably a better way or two that you could have done it than that. Well, several months later, um, one of our staff people, Mary Ann Reed, who's our connections coordinator, she came down. She said, can I speak to you? I said, sure, come on in. She had a printout of an email. She said, I just, I hate to have to give you this, but you have to have this. Well, I read it. I said, dear Mary Ann, please remove my name from the Faith Bridge Rolls. I won't be coming back. Several months ago, Pastor Ken called me at the air conditioning company where I work. He never realized who I was, and I never reminded him. But after the way he spoke to me that evening, I don't think I could ever hear God's voice through his preaching again with a clear mind. Well, you can imagine I was crushed, embarrassed, mad at myself, disappointed in myself, and I was like, oh my gosh. I said, what's her phone number? She gave me the phone number, and I called, and there was no answer, and I, I left a long message and said, look, I f feel so badly, because certainly because you say you're not gonna come back, and I would understand if you don't come back, but, but mostly I just hope that you won't go away from God because of that. I hope that you've settled in another church and that you're growing closer to God and not farther because of that. And, and I hung up and, and I said, what's her other number? And she gave me another. And I, I said the same message into two or three different voicemails. And then I emailed her and I sent an email. It was too little, too late. I never did hear from her. Nothing of spiritual value ever comes from bombast. The lack of humility closes doors that humility might have opened. If you want to influence our modern day Babylon, take a lesson from Daniel and serve humbly whomever God puts in your pathway. It's the only way that we'll ever earn the right to be heard as followers of Jesus. Now, it's important to realize the, the pathway of humility, it, it seldom pays off quickly. Uh, Daniel didn't serve, though, the Babylonian king humbly because he expected quick payoff. He did it because it was the right thing to do. And as he knew it was what God wanted us to do. And so I think this is the first thing we have to learn from chapter 1 in Daniel. Humility. And then there's a second thing. We have to learn how to pick our battles carefully. You see this in chapter one as well with Daniel and his three friends. Pick our battles carefully. Daniel knew which battles to fight and which ones to walk away from. He understood the difference between the things that he didn't like and the things that God had expressly forbidden. And there's a big difference between the two. And it's a difference that many of us fail to grasp. Let me illustrate. Uh, several weeks ago, I was talking with a friend here at Faith Bridge. And he said, oh, Pastor Ken, it's about my job and this guy that I work next to it in the next cubicle or however it was. He said, and he's just a foul-mouthed. He just curses all day long in GD and you just name it. And I just have to listen to it all day long. And I'm like, wow, it sounds rough. I said, well, I assume he's not a follower of Jesus or like you know, loves the Lord or anything. 
oh, heaven's not, he doesn't have any interest in God or church or the Bible or anything like that. I said, okay. He said, well, I decided what I'm going to do. I said, okay, well, what are you going to do? He said, I'm, I'm going to go in and I'm just going to tell him. I'm just going to look him in the eye and say, look, what you're doing, it's rude. It's inappropriate. It's disrespectful. It's irritating to everybody around you. And it's dishonoring to God. I said, okay. That's one thing you could do. I said, but let me ask you a question. Since you already told me that this guy isn't a follower of Jesus, then why would you expect him to act like, to talk like a follower of Jesus? Is that fair? Is that reasonable? So I asked him, which, which do you want more? I mean, really, think about it. Do you want him to pitch back his language so that you'll just feel a little bit more comfortable when you're around him? Or at a deeper level, wouldn't you rather just continue to be patient with him as Christ is patient with us, to be forgiving of him, to show respect to him, to show love to him, and, and continue to let your light shine brightly to the end that one day, maybe, just sort of like a tuning fork, uh, he would say to himself, huh, you know, this guy is different. Something's unique about him. What is it that makes you unique? That he might begin to see that your light is shining brightly and inquire, and you could tell him, well, actually, it, because I don't do it myself. It's the Holy Spirit through Christ who lives inside of me so that then he might trust in Christ and be filled up with his Holy Spirit so that everything that comes flowing out of him might be like living water. Wouldn't that really be the bigger win? See, I, I'm afraid that many of us Christians, we, we kind of act like big babies and we kind of come across as thin-skinned, particularly when we're around non-Christians. We take offense so easily when non-Christians live like non-Christians. But they're not being hypocritical. They're being entirely consistent. Daniel and his friends, they approached these things very different. I think we've got to learn from them. They didn't get bent out of shape about how, the, how others were living. In fact, Daniel was willing to cooperate as far as he possibly could. How far was that? Farther than you think. Now, which is not to say he, he wouldn't draw a line. Oh, no, no, no. He, he was plenty able to draw a line, and he did draw a line. But where did he draw the line? This is the key. This is what we really have to get. They drew the hard line when it came to them, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, them personally being asked to sin against God's word. That's where they drew the line. Otherwise, they let it go. So when they were assigned new names, stripped of their names that honored Yahweh, God, and they were assigned these new names that honored the, the, the Babylonian gods, they let it slide. It's like, nah, you can call us whatever you want to call us. When they were forcefully enrolled into this three-year course of astrology, occult, and all that dark stuff, they not only finished the course, they sat on the front row and they graduated at the top of the class. Why? Because... Having to learn about all that stuff did not mean that they had to practice it. And when they were placed into the service of a wicked king who had attacked Jerusalem and destroyed their temple, they served him. They served him well. They served him faithfully. It wasn't until they were personally asked to sin in this instance, to eat the, the non-kosher food, and in a later chapter that we'll get to, to bow down and to worship something that was not God. Oh, only when they were personally asked to sin, only then did they politely, and politely is the key, politely draw the line and say, is there a different way that we could go about this? We, we really can't do that. See, I, I think this is really where we Christians uh, need kind of a front end alignment because you, you have a lot of Christians and they're trying, we're trying to figure out where do we draw the line? Let me, let me illustrate it this way. You have on one extreme, 
You have uh, some people who say, I love God, I love Jesus, the Bible. And, but you look at their lifestyle, and it is as if they had just jumped into the river of you know, the flow of culture, and they're, they're just flowing right with it. There's nothing distinct. There's nothing unique. And they might even go so far as to say, yep, I just get along, go along, get along, and, and I don't want to cause any, any waves. You could say this is the person who is assimilating assimilating fully into culture. That is not what God in his word ever told us to do. In fact, you show me somebody who's assimilating fully into culture and I'll have to question, do you really have a relationship, a soul-saving, life-changing relationship <clears throat> with, with Jesus Christ deep down? You, 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 to, to look at you, I don't, I'd have to question because you're assimilating so completely into culture. Now, on the other extreme, you have these people, and these are the people that you could describe as isolators, separators. They're like the false prophets in Jeremiah 28 who were saying, don't go into the city. Don't have anything to do with them. Stay away from them. They're wicked. It's sinful. Bad. God's on our side. He hates them. Th these are the isolators, the separators. People even saying, let's pull off and do our own thing and Benedict option and this, this sort of thing. That is, that's a false prophet also. So if we rule out assimilation and isolation on the two extremes, what are we called to? Here it is in a word, infiltration. We're called to infiltration. Christ said, I want you to be in the world, but not of the world. I want you to let your light shine, be salt in a world that needs preserving. Don't assimilate fully, but certainly don't stand off with arrogance and isolate and separate and call down curses on it. That's not it, infiltration. And see, this is what Daniel and his three friends, they, they really had this. They, they just nailed it at every point along the way. I'm sure that, you know, Daniel didn't like being called the prince of Baal at all. But he said, hey, if that's what you want to call me, call me that. I'm not going to make a stink over that. I'm sure he was like, really? You want me to study a cult when I know there's the one true God? You know, really? I got to sit through that. But he did. He's like, hey, I'll sit on the front row. If that's what I got to learn, I'll learn it. I don't have to practice it. I'll be a good student. He understood the difference between the things that God had expressly forbidden and those that merely made him uncomfortable to be around. And there's a big difference. There's a difference between being around sin and having to personally commit sin. Oh, even when the pressure was great and the cost of obedience was high, Daniel refused to sin. He stood his ground, but at the same time, he also had to do a lot of standing around and, while other people sinned. And you've probably had that experience as well, huh? So how can he do this with a peaceful heart? I'll tell you how. Because he understood all along something. He knew that God was in control of who was in control even when it felt out of control. He had this so clearly. And he points it out from the very beginning of the book of Daniel. See it coming through so clearly. And this, friends, this is where the hope is found. And that leads to the third thing that we, that we need to observe from Daniel in these three in chapter one. Hope. Hope is essential. Obviously, Daniel, he, I'm sure he was terribly saddened grief-stricken to see Jerusalem, his homeland, destroyed, the temple torn down. And I'm sure he had plenty to be distressed and depressed about as he bounced along in some cart that dragged him off to this foreign land. He's just at the age of somebody going off to college. It's like, this is not exactly what mom and dad told me it was going to be like. I'm sure there was plenty for him to be upset about. But he had God's word inside of him. He knew 
what Jeremiah had written. He knew through Jeremiah, not only that, Jer- that, that God had said, if you don't turn back to me, I'm going to send the Babylonian army and they're going to wipe you out and they're going to cart you off into exile. He also knew the next part that Jeremiah had said, but then there will come a day. There will come a day and I will restore my people and I will judge their oppressors once this season of discipline for my people is, is complete. He knew that part. And it's here that Daniel made an important choice. He chose to interpret all the circumstances that were happening to him through the lens of faith. He responded to everything going on in the light of God's promises rather than in the light of Nebuchadnezzar's evils. Which lens are you going to look through? Fear and pessimism. See, don't you? Fear and pessimism, they don't make any sense when we know that victory ultimately is assured. And Daniel knew, despite what is happening right now, God is still in control. And there will come a day. He, and you know something, friends? God is still in control today. I think we Christians may have forgotten that. He's still in control today. We, I mean, good grief. We of all people should know this. Daniel lived 600 years before Jesus. He didn't have, even have Jesus and the cross and the resurrection. He didn't even have that part to, to, to lean on. We live on this side of the cross. We've seen God do even greater things than Daniel had seen. And so we of all people should be people of faith. How is it that you and I can live with peace and confidence and trust in a God that would allow us to live in a land of darkness for a while when it feels like all of hell is breaking loose around us? Here's how. By looking at the cross because the cross is the ultimate Babylon. The cross is the ultimate Babylon into which God thrust his son Thrusting him into this world that he never belonged in, that he never fit in, where he would be tempted to partake of all the delicacies of sin that we're tempted to partake in. Thrown all sorts of names that never fit who he was either. But he did it all with joy. And after living a life of perfection and sinlessness that you and I could never live. He willingly endured the cross that you and I deserved so that on that third day, he could rise victoriously, conquering the grave and assuring all of us, you who are linked to me by faith, so shall you live Choose life. Choose me, Jesus says. See, this, friends, this is how we can have hope. No matter what is swirling along around us. Because we know, if you've read to the end of the Bible, that he's coming back. And he'll right all wrongs at that point. So we live in the in-between right now, but we know how this thing's going to come out. Last Sunday afternoon, evening, last Sunday evening, um, the boys had the TV on, and uh, as they always want to do, they, they were searching for something sports-ish to watch. And one of them exclaimed, hey, Dad, the Astros are on. I said, well, great. And so I went over and sat down, and they were lying on the sofa, and and the three of us began to watch the Astros. And then I got thinking, wait a second. I think the Astros played the early game today. I think this game is already done. So I I pulled out my iPhone and and did a little snooping around. Sure enough, they beat the Tigers six to five in nine innings. But I didn't let on. I said, what, uh, what's the score? One of them said, five to five. I said, what inning are we in? Bottom of the ninth. 
well, I'm thinking to myself, we turned this on at just the right time. So, so Chris Carter comes up to bat, and he flies out uh, center field. And then Hank Conger comes up, and he grounds out to second. Two outs. The tension in the room is mounting. <laughs> Bottom of the ninth. I'm like, no, we're going to win this thing. <laughs> Six to five and nine innings, which tells me something good's getting ready to happen. So when uh, uh, Marisnik came up, um, I knew something good was going to happen. And sure enough, he blasts what look, we all jumped and we thought it was a home run. It's, there it is, but it fell just inside the park. But he's so fast, he got all the way to third base. And at that point, one of the boys is leaning over the edge of the sofa towards the TV, and he said, Dad, that's our winning run. That has to be our winning run. If we're going to win, that's going to have to be. I didn't tell him. They didn't know, but he's like, if we're going to win, you know, that's, that's got to be our winning run. And, and then a little Jose Altuve comes up, and he smacks a single right out into uh, center field, which was plenty enough for Marisnik to come racing in, and then they all consumed Altuve out there on second base. And, the celebra- and we jumped up and down. We were celebrating here. And, and I got to think to myself, it's, it's wonderful, exciting, and yet I already knew what was going to happen. It was still exciting. It was wonderful. And then I got thinking about it, friends. You and I, we who follow Jesus, we Christians, likewise, we know how this game is going to end. We know how this thing's going to come out. And since we do, does it make sense really, for us to act as if the sky is falling every time there's a bit of bad news that comes in or a court decision that is upsetting or a world crisis that's happening or a Christian that's persecuted in another part of the world. Is it is it really the right response for us just to wring our hands and say, well, there just must not be, it's out of control. God is, where is God? doesn't make sense because we know how this thing's going to end ultimately. For that matter, bring it to the micro level, it's just sort of the, the right here in suburbia. Does it make sense when perhaps you've lost your job or you've been laid off or you get a diagnosis and it's a bad diagnosis? You know, or you're going through a marital issue or maybe you've gone through a divorce not making light of any of these things. They're all huge. We feel them at a terribly deep level. And there's much grief and there's much tears. Or if you have a son or a daughter who's gone far away from God or that you're estranged from, or if you're experiencing a financial downturn and you're rightfully worried about it, but does it make sense for us to just wring our hands and say, oh no, what in the world's ever gonna happen? No, it doesn't make sense. These are simply the enemy's short-term temporary blows on the way to get his final and great defeat. We have to keep the end in mind, right? We who have placed our trust in Jesus Christ, we have hope. We are people not who are despairing. We're people who look to the future full of hope. Daniel and his three friends. This is why they were able to go on, even with everything that was thrown their way, because they knew ultimately who would win. And so do we, Christian. So do we. So let's choose not to forget that. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for the very relevant story of this man, Daniel, and his three friends. How timely it is. It's 2,600-year-old 2600 story, and yet it just transfers perfectly into our lives and into our world, just like your word always does. Lord, forgive us, those of us who who know you and love you for wringing our hands and just being so the sky is falling doomish and gloomish. 
Not that there aren't bad things that are happening, that are swirling around, that the darkness is encroaching upon us. It is and it is real, but help us, God, to peer through that and see at the end of the tunnel there is always light. There's always you. And we know ultimately how this thing's going to end. Thank you for the way that Daniel and his friends modeled that so winsomely. Won't you give us the grace to live likewise? And if you're here, friend, and you've never even opened up your heart to Jesus in the first place, you've, maybe you've come to church off and on over the years, and, but you've never really said, I, I am a sinner who needs what he did on the cross to be the sacrifice for my sins as well as for all the other people. I need that to apply for my life. If that's you today, I just invite you in the quietness of this moment to open up your heart and just say, Lord, I, I want to become a follower. I want to become your disciple. I want to learn what it means to be a Christian. I need you to come in. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins, to cleanse me of the unrighteousness, to fill me full of your spirit, to repurpose me with new direction. And so right here and right now, I just invite you, you tell him that personally. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Welcome to Postscript. My name is Michael Sullivan and I'm the business administrator here at FaithBridge. I'm joined by Pastor Ken, who just gave a great sermon to kick off our Unshakable series. Uh, we're gonna jump into a lot of questions. Thanks for being here with us, Pastor Ken. Uh, the first question is actually one that you mentioned in your sermon uh, that you would address. And the question uh, really comes to that you had mentioned uh, that all the captives would be castrated but the prophet said that God wanted them to multiply. So how do we <laughs> that would be hold hard. that in balance? Right. So let me restate what I meant to s state, uh, because I think in one of the hours I did sit, state that wrongly. All 10,000 of them were not. Um, the cream of the crop who would go in close to the king and to the king's harem with the concubines, of, it was just protocol that they would do that because they didn't want young men that were smart and handsome and all of these things that the Bible says. Mm -hmm. um, and so that combined with the knowledge uh, that we have just of J Jewish history, heritage, lineage was so important. Mm -hmm. And throughout scripture, you always hear about who begat who and who begat who. And I, that was, in that day, that was everything. Um, you know, today we hang our different plaques on the wall and our different trophies, but back then it was everything. And the silence is deafening um, f f on Daniel's, who did he leave? There's our Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, same thing. So you combine the fact, huh, we never hear of any offspring, and we know that it was just typical protocol. Kings w would do that in that day, and and then even their boss, the the chief eunuch, like, oh well, that must have been part of the story. Talk about a rotten, horrible, awful, bad day. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Well, you mentioned Daniel. One of the other questions that we got was so oftentimes in the Bible we know. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego by their names that they were given, yeah. but Daniel is just Daniel. Yeah, the Hebrew he, name. And that's their Babylonians, the three guys. Why is that? Right. I have no idea. I guess it's just because of all the little songs that we sing in church when we're kids. It, it was, it's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Maybe there's a deeper reason. I, I don't know what that reason is that we tend to call them their Babylonian names. 
Yeah. Maybe easier than the other ones because none of them are exactly easy That's to go true. through. That's so uh, the next question was just simply you referenced a book that you've been using sure. in this yeah, series. Book. Larry Osborne is a friend of mine out in uh, San Diego, pastors a fantastic church called uh, North Coast, and he writes this book, Thriving in Babylon. It just came out and and it was over the summer break I read it, and which was really very much of the inspiration, and I, which I borrow liberally from uh, in this opening installment. But it's very good, and I highly recommend it. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the next question is really, we got a couple of questions along the same lines, and so this one is just asking that, you know, so many times we see Jesus operating from love and from humility. Sure. Uh, but there's also moments where we see him turning over tables and acting in righteous anger. And so what is the application for us as we're trying to balance those two? When do we sure. respond in love? And is there a time when? Right. Well, <laughs> we Christians don't like to think about this, but when did he turn over the table, tables? Who was he inclined to get the most upset with? It was the religious people. See, I, I'm afraid we Christians, we get the most upset uh, by the secular people. Th that's not who he all, he was always uh, tr trying to draw them in, but it was the blasted Pharisees that, uh, or, and the other people who were, you know, doing the things that they were doing that he was always getting so bent out of shape. So I think we have to, to keep in mind um, probably if you've got to go into work and it's a secular workplace, well, even if it's a Christian workplace, but certainly if it's a secular workplace, you don't agree uh, with, you know, something that you know, I shouldn't have to do this job, I'm better than this, or you, you can't start turning over tables. We don't get that permission um, from Scripture. Again, uh, the next question is, is kind of we had multiples uh, along this line. And the question is about Hitler. It says, should a Christian have humbly followed Hitler provided they were not required to personally commit sin? Or is there an obligation sometimes to say no to a ruler or authority? Absolutely. And in this country, we, we have the perfect opportunity to do that. We each get to vote. Mm. And if we feel so inclined and called by God, we can even run for office and try to bring about change. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, absolutely, but it's the, it's the mode or the method um, that, that we're really talking about. We have to work through um, the appropriate channels. Um, now, let's, while we're talking about Hitler, which is, is it's, it's a good question, let's remember as wicked and horrible, terrible as Hitler was, which was like Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, both of those are probably among, probably two of the 20 most powerful people in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. So th they have a lot in common mm -hmm. uh, and wicked, um, I, I should have added. But let's go back to where Christianity started. You had all these Roman emperors mm -hmm and Nero and all that. I mean, Christianity has always had to swim against the current of typically the, 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 the residing power. And that's why we often try to need to remind ourselves we're a counter-cultural faith. Now, in America, we get to vote, vote. You can run for office, run for office. Don't forget anything we talked about. Be, be humble, choose your battles wisely, and you know, keep hope and, and all. But we can't ever expect that the government is going to do for us what God promises. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we wouldn't need God, would we? We would just need a government. And, and I think this is where we who had lived in America back in particularly the 80s, mm -hmm. some of us are around, but were around back then. You had the moral majority, you had Jerry Falwell, you had... Uh, Pat Robertson, you had Dr. Dobson, and, and wonderful men, and and th who were trying to leverage all the influence that they can, could uh, upon uh, our culture, 
And I think some good came out of that. I think where we Christians are grasping today is now that that has all been tipped on its ear, what in the world do we do? And I think that's where we have to say, okay, let's go back and let's learn fr from, from Daniel. And let's remember, uh, kingdoms will come, kingdoms will go. Sometimes a kingdom will be favorable to the things of God. Constantine came along in the 300s AD and all of a sudden said, Christianity is the state religion. Boom. You can build big, beautiful churches, the likes of which we can still tour in Europe. Okay, but, but then there's other times that Christianity is not in vogue and Christians are persecuted. And so um, I think we have to keep in mind, ultimately, our Savior is Jesus and Jesus alone. No government, no president, no ruler is ever going to ultimately be able to, to be what only Jesus can be for us. It's really to kind of stay on that third point that you talked about, which was just to hope in God and, right. and continue walking in that. That's sure. good. That's helpful. Uh, the last question is just simply in these modern times, I think so many times we're looking, who do we point the blame at? Who is our enemy? Mm -hmm. Who is it that we're against sure. in these times? Who is our enemy? Sure. Well, let's remember the enemy is the enemy, the devil, Satan. Um, we jotted down several passages just, you know, that are, I think, particularly relevant. Ephesians 6, 12, um, where we're reminded, look, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, um, but against the rulers and the authorities and the powers and the principalities of this dark world that have spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So you're looking at a person who has skin on them and you're saying, you are the enemy. Well, no, you, you are a lost person that needs Jesus, but you are being used by the enemy. Uh, yes, perhaps. But I think this is where we have to keep the grand, uh, you know, picture in mind and, and remember that, that we're living out this life in this kingdom uh, on earth as citizens of a different kingdom. And we re realize then, okay, there's, there's altogether different spiritual things that are going on here. And, and let's not fall for the bait of thinking that person himself or herself uh, is, the, which is hard, uh, especially when you have somebody who's in a position of authority. But here again, Peter gives us some good counsel um, in 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17. Submit yourselves, he said. And these were the Christians who were getting persecuted and killed, uh, you know, by the Roman authorities. Uh, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as a supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but don't use your freedom as a cover up for evil. Live as God's servants or God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers, fear God, and honor the emperor. Well, sometimes we want to read that and say, except when his name is this person, but it doesn't say that. <laughs> and that's where we have to say, okay. So here we go. That was helpful. Thank you so much, Pastor Ken, for being here with us. Thank you for joining us on Postscript. We'll be back next week as we continue on in this series called Unshakable with Part 2. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.